Good afternoon, Praful. And uh, who is there in the L team? Who is coordinating? Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Ma'am, Dr. Vineet is coordinating. Okay. Uh, I'll ask Vineet if you're there. Yes, sir. Okay, so should I check if my screen is being shared? Okay. Do I choose entire screen or do I choose window? Ma'am, you should choose entire screen, ma'am. Okay. To avoid mirroring, don't share your entire screen or browser window. Share just a tab or a different window instead. Just leave that part and Can you see my presentation? Yes, no, ma'am, not yet. Okay, I'll just stop and just try again. So should I select a tab or my entire screen? Ma'am, entire screen. Entire screen. Okay. Ma'am, you should ignore that message. Okay. Ignore. So I do ignore. Yes, yes, it doesn't. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And minimize that tab and start your presentation, ma'am, on PowerPoint. One second. Minimize which tab? The tab which you have opened right now, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Then open your presentation. Okay. Yes. And should I go to slideshow then? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. It is visible. Visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good afternoon. Yes, so today's topic is uh, recent advances in um, anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Um, it's my pleasure to be giving this talk to all of you. Um, before I begin, uh, you would have attended my previous faculty lecture on decision making. And I would like to reinforce that this is something which is ongoing and a continuous process. And each and every case, you have to... Uh, uh, weigh the pros and cons of every possible option and then choose the best um, uh, course of action for that particular case. It is very custom made and sort of tailor made for each patient. Um, so therefore that includes case selection, surgical technique and also don't forget to look at comorbidities which may be local ocular comorbidities or they may be systemic. Now, just to give you a few points, uh, when you're considering the case selection, you're also considering whether to do the surgery or not. Uh, and uh, then you will also decide how to plan and counsel the patient and the relatives accordingly. And important considerations for the patient will be uh, the age, what are the patient's visual requirements, what is the status of the other eye, what is the predicted recovery, and what is the survival of the craft, and also uh, uh, what is the survival of the patient for in case there are any other complications such as some um, life-threatening disease and so on. Uh, you would like to know the disease, what is the pathology, what is the prognosis, and what is, uh, and then of course the, all the details about the eye. Uh, we do know that there are several options in keratoplasty, and uh, there have been several recent advances which have made a significant change uh, and an improvement in the way we handle the patient and the outcomes that we can offer. So therefore, there has been a major paradigm shift in corneal surgery from penetrating keratoplasty to layer-specific corneal grafts, or what we call customized corneal component replacement. Uh, the other advances that are worth noting are uh, sutureless procedures, uh, which are posterior lamella, and also anterior lamella procedures can also sometimes be sutureless or glue-assisted. And uh, in terms of anterior lamellar keratoplasty, there have been significant improvements in both the techniques and technologies over the last decade. Uh, once again, I would like to emphasize that in your considerations, we must never forget that keratoplasty is not without complications, and the most dreaded complication is infection and loss of the eye. And you have to remember that we are using a live corneal tissue, which is from a donor, which is not sterilized. It is. Uh, it is. Uh, Disinfected, every effort is made to follow all aseptic precautions, 
but there is sometimes a risk of an organism uh, getting by and you may end up with a serious infection. Modern day surgeons do have several treatment modalities available and also a whole lot of antibiotics and uh, newer techniques uh, at our uh, disposal. So certainly the quality of the surgery we offer has, we are becoming more and more um, bold in the kind of cases we uh, take up and, uh, and the, the kind of surgeries we do. There is always the context of the supply of donor tissue and every tissue that is harvested should be used uh, fruitfully and it should never go waste. So one has to always make sure that you have a proper system in place, that you have a suitable patient available for the donor tissue. And not to forget, you always decide whether to graft or not and then choose the procedure most beneficial for the patient. So these are the two key questions which you ask yourself and for the junior residents as well I would like to emphasize when you're working up the case try not to just uh, just sort of use, follow the routine procedure of just you know uh, looking at the superficial things and filling up the file please engage yourself in the decision making process and uh, try to understand all the nuances of what best can be done and sometimes you may come up with better options which can be planned with the OPD. So the detailed history and clinical examination will be done, visual acuity, refraction, slip lamp biomicroscopy, corneal tomography, check the sensations, pachymetry, posterior segment evaluation, and not to forget clinical photographs. They're very important. As far as the therapy is concerned, uh, for corneal opacities, we have medical as well as surgical. And in medical, don't forget that there are several, uh, several advances in uh, high quality optical refractive corrections and a host of new contact lens fitting procedures. Um, medication may not be the whole and soul of the treatment. For example, you may have to use medication to make the patient fit for surgery. And sometimes the medication may work wonders and you may be able to avoid surgery altogether. And then of course, counseling of the patient and the family accordingly. Again, I would like to emphasize that there are certain conditions over the years we have realized are extremely important. In the case of a corneal graft, you must focus on these areas and specifically make sure that you are not missing out. One is herpes simplex keratitis. I think everybody in the center is well versed with this. Uh, but you must keep reinforcing that it, uh, sometimes HSV keratitis may be missed or may be confused with something else. And the other is glaucoma. Uh, because that can make a tremendous impact on the outcome. And the, the glaucoma may become much worse after surgery. So it is very important to work with the glaucoma colleagues in knowing what is the right thing to do, whether to go for glaucoma procedure first, later, or whatever. And uh, remember that the measurement of the intraocular pressure also becomes compromised after the corneal graft. So you have to take that into consideration as to whether what you're estimating as the pressure and plus other me measures of controlling glaucoma and monitoring the progress, such as visual field tests, etc., may, may be very challenging. Uh, basically, look at the visual potential. Is there any active treatable disease? Look at the ocular surface and decide whether it's unilateral or bilateral and what is the best option for the patient. As far as treatment modalities are concerned, when it, uh, for anterior lamellar keratoplasty, a host of patients earlier would be left as they were because the prognosis with PK used to be poor. However, with better results with anterior lamellar graphs, a lot of these patients are offered surgery. And here I would like to emphasize the role of uh, liberal stem cell uh, deficiency and liberal stem cell transplantation that has made a sea change in the level of care that we can provide to the patient. So you always understand what are the implications, what are the limitations, and what are the specific considerations. Talking about anterior lamellar keratoplasty, the corneal wave and the endothelial cell count can be less stringent, but this may not always be so because if you do not have an in-house eye bank and you are in a whole and soul separate facility, then you would like to Cornea, even if you're doing an anterior lamella keratoplasty, because if you have a perforation on the table or there is some other calamity, then you should have the ability to transplant the cornea in total. Um, now, coming to the anterior lamella keratoplasties, what are the indications? Uh, either there is an anterior stromal disease or an, a, a scar which is involving only the anterior layers of the cornea and the endothelium is healthy, such as stromal dystrophies or post infection scars not involving the endothelium or scars from non perforating trauma. 
or they are ectatic corneal disorders which require strengthening of the cornea but the endothelium being healthy such as corneal ectasias as you know that is keratoconus um, is a classic example so usually they are indicated for corneal pathologies affecting the anterior less than or equal to 85 to 95% of the cornea where the desmoid membrane and endothelium is healthy and um, Averaging sparing the corneal epithelium and surface because if the corneal epithelium and surface are unhealthy, then even an ALK will not be successful. You will end up with a persistent epithelial defect or uh, an infection. So, therefore, you must take care of the corneal epithelium and surface, restore that by limbal stem cell transplant or lubricants or whatever is required, and then proceed with the anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So contraindications would be if the posterior lamella, that is the decimals and the endothelium, are not healthy, there's corneal edema and bullous keratopathy, low endothelial counts, ice syndromes, and so on and so forth. Now talking about the surgical technique. So um, anterior lamella, very simple lamella keratectomy can also be done where you just excise the anterior layer. This can be done if you have open layer and anterior most layers of the stroma. This can be done manually or it can be done using the eczema laser, which is called photo uh, it can be done for Riesbachler, Thiel Menke, superficial involvement in granular and avalanoid dystrophies, keloid and Salzman nodular degeneration. And in both these conditions, sometimes you can just peel off the lesion, which comes off pretty easily. So a manual peeling technique, microkeratome assisted keratectomy can be done, eczema laser, P uh, PTK, I'm sorry, I said PRK earlier, I meant uh, PTK, phototherapeutic keratectomy, where it is simply removing the uh, superficial layer of the cornea. However, now with the modern techniques, you can even do uh, uh, associated with that uh, uh, a, a refracted correction as well, but it's not very easy to be sure about the correct algorithm to use. And of course, there is also also, femtosecond laser assisted keratectomy. The other thing is, uh, you can do tectonic reconstructive and excisional anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So, if you have the calcitrin corneal ulcers which have not corneal, you can intervene more uh, early and go for a therapeutic procedure. It would be intended to restore the integrity of the globe or reduce the uh, burden of infection. It can be used as a several as a first step of several which may be required to achieve optical clarity and visual rehabilitation. An example would be present graphs for PMT, PMT, UK or patch graphs for impending or actual perforation. And then we have automated lamellar therapeutic keratoplasty and deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. So all of you are very fortunate that you are working in a center where the A to Z of all these procedures is available. And it's important for you to understand uh, what you see and be involved and engaged in the procedure going on because when you leave from here you must not forget what you have learned. Um, now the ease of performance uh, is of course a benefit of doing anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Sometimes there could be disadvantages because sometimes you could relative irregularity of the resultant surface if you have done a manual dissection for example. Um, and uh, uh, it, it, you can also have a sub epithelial case with the PTK, for example, which may be decreased by intraoperative use of mitomycin C, 0.02%, which can be applied for 30 seconds to 2 minutes to the residual stromal bed. So, therefore, um, with the advancement in technology, knowledge, and innovation, this is the whole gamut of anterior lamellar surgeries. You have an automated lamellar therapeutic keratoplasty hemi-automated lamellar keratoplasty where the host is dissected manually and the donor tissue is cut with the microkeratome. Superficial or sutureless anterior lamellar keratoplasty where uh, the, uh, which is usually when the anterior 180 to 200 microns of the cornea is removed and replaced and no sutures are required, only a bandage contact lens is applied. Superficial uh, hemi-automated Cause deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. I would like to emphasize again that the comorbidity should not be forgotten and don't forget cataracts. So you have any person above the age of 40 who is coming with a, with, with a corneal opacity and decrease in vision, you have the decision to take whether the, the, the poor vision is because of an oncoming or a developing cataract or is it because of the corneal opacity. And here we have um, several instruments, particularly eye trays can be very useful in differentiating the level of the uh, 
um, uh, the, the disturbance in vision or the blur which is created to some extent, whether it is due to the cataract at the, or whether it is at the corneal level. And glaucoma and other pathologies and of course systemic disease. So special considerations, as I mentioned before, uh, therapeutic keratoplasty, cataract, aphakia, and pseudophakia. So this is important because this is uh, everybody is going to the level of or spectacle independent life, and uh, every effort should be made to get the best possible correction. Uh, and keeping in view all of this, it involves a lot of planning. And then there are high risk graphs. Uh, as we know that there would be deep vascularization and of course if you have a high risk graft and you can manage an anterior lamellar keratoplasty it is so much better because it reduces the, or in fact eliminates the risk of endothelial rejection. So uh, therapeutic tectonic or emergency keratoplasty such as patch lamellar would be done for conditions of the cornea that threaten the globe and the integrity and the intervention you have to decide when and how. So are you going to give the medical treatment first? Are you going to try to control the infection first? Are you going to operate straight away? And all that has to be decided. Regarding the lens, again, you have to take a call whether to do the surgery at one go, whether to do one step or two step, and which one to be done before. As far as the anterior lamellar keratoplasty procedures go, I would generally recommend that one would go for the keratoplasty first, because then you know you have a stable cornea, you know what is the, uh, the level of astigmatism, and you can do a more accurate biometry, and you can proceed for the cataract surgery later on. Um, and if it is an aphakic patient and you're planning a procedure there, I would suggest that you would like to do the secondary IOL first. Uh, um, but again, it may depend from patient to patient uh, and uh, what is the type design and fixation and then proceed with the surgery. Um, uh, and of course, if it is pseudophakic, then uh, you have to see whether the IOL is stable and whether it's going to remain or whether you're going to have to change it uh, during the procedure or later on. Uh, just a little word about the donor tissue. Uh, don't forget that with anterior lamellar keratoplasties, we have less stringent requirement. But at the same time, it's not very easy to use it for infant cornea, less than three, because the uh, cornea size is very, very less as well as its um, tectonic strength. So generally, three to 70 years, and if we have a, a cornea of a child less than 10 years, it's not that easy to fit it into the microkeratome. So largely for anterior lamellar, uh, if you're doing a, a, a microkeratome or a artificial anterior-based procedure, I would go for the patients above the age of 20. So generally 20 to uh, 20 plus. Uh, if the patient is more than 70 years old, please check where, what is the level of arcus. What is the on button clear area? That is, what is the diameter of clear cornea available? And you may d decide whether to use it or not depending upon the age of the patient. If it's a very elderly person who has its own arcus and is not concerned about cosmesis, it doesn't matter too much. If there is a slight rim of arcus in the tissue, you use. So it's all a lot of planning and uh, basically concern for the patient and uh, attention to detail, which is important. So don't forget when you're grading a cornea uh, in the eye bank. And it's a pediatric attention. Write a few notes there and you will put that up in your list so that when the surgeon is planning which cornea to use or allotting the case, they take all this into consideration. And of course, the corneal storage medium, all this is important. Now, just to give you some practical tips, uh, this is an example of a 25 year old patient who had a nebular macular corneal opacity, which was unilateral. Uh, the uncorrected visual acuity was 1 by 60. So such a patient, one would normally like a contact lens trial. And often with a rigid, hard, a rigid contact lens, they can get very good vision. However, depending upon the occupation, the hygiene, the affordability of the patient, and the, uh, it may not always be the best approach. So in this particular patient, he was not a good candidate. The depth of the opacity was 220 microns and usually when we do a superficial anterior lamellar keratoplasty, we like the depth to be less than 200. So here you have to decide whether one is going to take the possibility that you have a little a deeper opacity left behind and whether to go for a semi-automated or whether one goes straight away for a um, um, manual dissection. So these are the, the, the discussions that one would have with your colleagues, your assistants, as well as the patient. So you look at the refractive error of the patient. As you can see, this patient was hypermetropic. So if one, uh, let's assume that this patient had a more superficial opacity, but being hypermetropic, 
PTK would not be a good option because it's going to make the patient further hypermetropic. But if, if the patient had been myopic, then PTK would really have been a good option, provided, of course, that the opacity was not so deep. I'm just giving you an example of all the things that you have to keep in mind. And the laser interferometry was 6 by 60. It was, it was suspected that this was probably a very long standing opacity from very early childhood and uh, that there was an underlying amblyopia. But realistically speaking, the patient was very motivated and very keen on surgery. But one would have had the option of not doing anything because the other eye was 6'9", the opacity was not very noticeable or problematic. But the patient really wanted the, the, the surgery, so therefore one went ahead. So in this particular patient, uh, one did uh, uh, ALTK. Just get the picture to work. Yes, so th this is uh, using the Moria microkeratome. So you have a suction ring which uh, you apply firmly and then you have a microkeratome head uh, with, a, with a required blade. This is a rotatory type of microkeratome. You have to be careful that you use a very good wide uh, speculum so that the, uh, uh, the microkeratome movement is not impaired by the presence of the speculum. So this is the host cut and uh, you can see that if you scan the uh, remnant, you can see in this particular case that there was a bit of the opacity left, but you would like to see whether that is affecting the visual axis and if it is likely to cause any problem or not. If necessary, one can do a further layer removal manually. And here we have the application of glue, the donor tissue has been cut. Remember that when you cut the donor tissue, it may not be exactly the same size as it has cut in the host. This, these variations come because there are uh, variations in the, uh, the uh, corneal curvature as well as the pressure applied and therefore it's very important to first put the donor tissue on the host and check what is the size you require and then refine it accordingly. Here the glue has been applied on the entire bed. However, now recently um, it is uh, being recommended that one does not apply it on the entire bed. One can just apply it at the edge because basically the flap is about 180 to 200 microns, a little thicker than the LASIK flap and it, it is able to that very comfortably. And then you have the um, uh, bandage contact lens applied and this is the result post-operatively. So you can see the patient improved, re regained the required vision and um, had a minimal change in the astigmatism. So this was uh, the patient's OCT showing the uh, cornea and also showing the regularity of the cornea with the uh, myers. So these things are important because uh, you have to remember when you use a sutured uh, graft or a sutured less graft, the main problem is that one wants to control the astigmatism perfectly. This is another example of a Salzman nodular degeneration. Here, the lesions were much deeper after peeling off. There was a deeper opacity available and therefore further manual dissection had to be done to remove further deeper layers of the cornea. And then um, after removing the, one is satisfied that one has reached the required clarity, then one can apply tissue. So just to show you that the lesions are deeper. So this is a layer by layer dissection. And then when you come to get to clear cornea, one can apply the uh, donor and uh, secure it in place. Uh, this is an example of uh, using um, vacuum trifying to uh, get a desired depth. So with the microkeratome, you are uh, using a, a, a layers of different uh, depth of cutting. Here with the vacuum trifine, you can control the depth of cutting by rotating the um, blade. Uh, it's too short a time to go into details as to how it, uh, you know, exact um, uh, manipulation and the exact titration. And I'm sure all of you will get a chance in the OT to have a look as to how the trifine is applied. Is, uh, is calculated. Basically, one quarter turn cuts it about 62 microns, and then you decide initially uh, how much is the depth you want, and you, uh, you go accordingly. The benefit of the vacuum trifine is that it gives you this graded depth, and it also secures the uh, hose so that you can very comfortably center the uh, 
uh, the, um, the the cut uh, appropriately and uh, it is a more controlled method rather than using the traditional manual trefines and here is an example of a dalk where where uh, uh, the big bubble dalk has been perform performed and uh, the uh, you can see the decimal shining and the donor cornea is about to be applied um, I have five minutes. I thought I'd quickly share a case presentation. Um, this is an, uh, to, to sort of combine everything that I've mentioned. This is a four month old male child, the tissue opacity in the left eye present since birth. The child had a squint, manifest squint, and there was no history of any particular episode of redness discharge and no ongoing problem with that eye. It was a full term normal vaginal delivery. This was the first child and there was no other history of similar ailment in anybody else in the family. So um, patient was taken up for surgery. This was done recently in the COVID pandemic. So we wanted to minimize the um, intervention uh, procedures in the OT. So we decided to do the planning. Uh, we planned for an anterior lamella keratoplasty, but we didn't do another EUA before. We decided to do the EUA on the day of the planned surgery. When the EUA was done, uh, and in this particular case, the differential diagnosis was whether it is a corneal keloid or a dermoid. Uh, it is a little unusual in its location. Um, Shows it is very white, but clinically it had a slightly yellowish white uh, color. And uh, to our surprise, um, uh, under the microscope, there was an area of uh, haziness around it, which was which was unexpected. The kind that you would get with a healed keratitis. So that was a bit unexpected. But otherwise, clinically, it was looking like a dermoid. Um, and uh, the other eye was normal. We measured the corneal diameter. We took the help of the eye OCT. Um, to see uh, the, the depth of involvement and from the OCT appearance one could see that it, the, the problem was more anterior and uh, it looked uh, obviously uh, as we felt clinically also that the posterior layers of the cornea were unaffected so we could go ahead with a manual um, keratoplasty. Uh, in this particular case, as you can see, the lesion is a little off-center, part of it is going quite near the limbus. So we center the uh, area of dissection so that you still remain centered on the visual axis and remove the lesion uh, largely in total. The aim is not to remove the entire opacity because if one went for that, one would go too close to the limbus and that would increase the risk of problems of uh, early loosening of sutures and of course in the case of PK that would lead to the risk of a higher risk of endothelial rejection. In this particular case, a Hesper parent refine was not used because when you have an irregularity on the surface, you're not able to get a good vacuum. So therefore, a manual refine was used to first make a lamella uh, sort of a guide as to the level or the, uh, uh, the sur circle that one would cut. And then the, the, the dissection was continued using um, a, a knife and uh, a manual dissection going layer by layer. There was a bit of, there were vessels, it was vascularized, there was bleeding, removed intact. And as you can see, the residual cornea still shows considerable amount of opacity. And this is in keeping with the appearance that we had first seen. Surrounding the lesion, you could see that there was an uh, interstitial case. So then one went manually to go to a deeper depth, trying to get to a layer that one would felt satisfied that the visual axis would be clear and the patient would have reasonably good vision. And that is when we reached the appropriate layer, we uh, then uh, went ahead and did the um, donor cut uh, after measuring the depth that we wanted. And the donor was cut with the microkeratome. It was defined to the correct size and then it was sutured in place. But the surgery was uneventful. Post-operatively, the patient uh, did quite well. Um, the the, the vision, vision improved. The patient was tolerating patching very well. Uh, we were giving uh, part-time occlusion and uh, topical steroids, lubricants, and, and um, the histopathology confirmed the diagnosis as a dermoid. Actually, it was a lipodermoid because there was quite a lot of element of fatty tissue, adipose tissue in it as well. 
So uh, with that, I'll stop here. I wanted to um, cover uh, all the recent advances in a very practical way. Um, the class is certainly not comprehensive because there is a lot with that has happened. And I would encourage that all of you read up and also make sure that whenever you come across cases or surgeries which are being performed, uh, you should uh, reinforce your knowledge by checking up what is um, the relevant uh, literature there and then. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, there is one question. One second. Yeah, uh, there's a question. Why in a faking patient we do IOL implantation before corneal surgery? So uh, it will depend. Um, it will depend upon the stability and it will depend upon whether the corneal surgery is lamellar or not. So uh, and also on the ability to see. So you have to balance the stability of the eye, the ability to see what you're doing. Um, if supposing, uh, they, uh, and also the, um, uh, the, the, the refractive change that you expect. So, um, uh, of course, uh, if you do the corneal surgery first, then uh, you would have a more clear view. You would also have accurate biometry for the keratometry and you could proceed and do the secondary IOL later on. So, that option could also be there. So, it will depend. As I said, uh, it will depend from case to case. And it is also very important whether it is an anterior lamellar procedure that you're doing or a posterior lamellar procedure. And Namrata is going to cover the posterior lamellar procedure. Do I need to stop sharing screen in case you have to stop presenting? Okay, Gauri, so satisfied? All right. Thank you for asking the question. It is an important question. And I think we can write, we can write a little bit of an algorithm for patients with aphakia as well as uh, 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 cataract and all the scenarios. So this can only happen if you collect all the notes and the case scenarios that you see and remember that in which patient we did what and what was the outcome and then you'll be able to develop a good algorithm for this. If there is no further question, we can go over to posterior lamella keratoplasty. We need. Yes, I am here. Uh, ma'am is logging for op from office or LT6? No, no ma'am ma is in LT6. Okay, okay. You are there now? Yes, yes sir. Okay, another important question, Suman. Uh, Ma'am, do we take oversized donor tissue in ALTK or it have to be of same size as donor refined area? If yes, then how much oversizing? Such an important question. And uh, now let's take it step by step. In ALTK, as I said, we cannot totally control. The best would be that you have taken the microkeratome, you've cut a circle in the host. And you cut a circle in the donor and they're exactly matched and you put it. But it doesn't happen that way. Of course, with the um, ALTK, you do have some control about the diameter. But even then, it's not perfect. Many times you would have seen that it is supposed to cut 10 and cuts 9 and so on. So that's the first thing. So never assume that the microkeratome is going to cut exactly what you want. Now, oversized donor tissue in ALTK is 
not recommended unless you go only for the 0.25 donor oversize but sometimes problems have occurred where a gap has been present because the donor was smaller so in simple words we don't want a donor which is smaller so therefore to be safe most corneal surgeons will either go for same size or 0.25 more in a uh, donor tissue with ALTK and I would suggest beginners to go for 0.25 over because you can always tuck it in in the periphery you can always adjust it to fit um, but it is a challenge so what I personally do is I take the donor I, I superimpose it on my host bed and see how it's fitting and then sometimes I will decide on the table like for example this child that you saw this dermoid I, if I remember correctly I think I had done 0.25 over we debated a lot about it but ultimately if I remember correctly it was 0.25 and I'll update you on it <laughs> next time yeah so Namita is here so I'll hand over Yeah, Radhika, hello. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, you are audible. Okay. I will be talking about the first one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Ye
I have abnormalities even in AC IOL, even when there's a glaucoma shunt device. The only thing is that the AC should be at least 2.5 millimeters, and I want you to have a look at these cases where you can do a DSEC, but you possibly will not try to do a DMEC because then it's going to get difficult. So, so advantages, advantages of endothelial keratoplasty or DSEC per se is that it avoids open sky procedure. There are hardly any sutures. Uh, the uh, cornea is tectonically stable with predictable topography, with no astigmatism or minimal astigmatism, with less graft failure due to ocular surface disease. And all the corneal nerves are preserved because you've not severed them at all. Now, it's a much faster visual rehabilitation if after full thickness penetrating keratoplasty, it takes about a year for patient to be visually rehabilitated. After the DMEC graft, it takes one month only. So, as postgraduates, you are supposed to know these figures, 12 months, 3 months and 1 month. Then uh, we did do a DSEC for a variety of conditions and this is just to show that if you have a cornea like this, where, where the stroma is scarred, then probably DSEC is not going to work and these cases are best done by full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. Now, how do you cut the DSEC graft? Suppose you have a 500 microns of cornea, you split the 500 microns of cornea into 350, uh, which is used for anterior lamellar keratoplasty, which was uh, very elegantly described by Professor Radhika Tandon. And the uh, posterior part, which is about 150 microns, you use it for posterior lamellar keratoplasty or DSEC. Of course, now we try to use thinner grafts because thinner grafts give you a better quality of vision. And there are various ways in, by which these grafts can be uh, injected intracamerally. You can use a forceps or suture pull-through technique, hit suture technique that we described. There are various endocerters, but the most popular by and large is the Busen glide, which I'm sure you all have seen. Now this, now, this is, is just to show you one example where, which was referred to us for a full thickness corneal transplantation, but we thought we'll try and do a DSEC in this case. So this was Fuchs dystrophy. So notice we are doing epithelioraxis, which is the first rexis followed by the uh, desmetorexis. So the desmet's membrane is quite fibrosed and scarred here, which is being removed with a reverse Sinsky hook or instrument which is dedicated for this. Uh, so, uh, so uh, the diseased desmet membrane, it comes out. Of course, in this case, we had to do a cataract surgery also. So, so that was the third rexis. So we have epithelial rexis, desmetal rexis, and anterior capsular rexis, which was done, followed by FACO emulsification and foldable intraocular lens implantation. But important, followed by a posterior lamellar graft, which is loaded onto the Bucin's glide. The Bucin's glide is inverted, and then it is intracamerally pulled inside. And, and then, then air, air bubble is instilled, instilled so that the DSEC graft gets stuck to the back of the cornea. Air has been used for tamponade by the retinal surgeons, so it is now being used by the anterior segment surgeons to tamponade the uh, graft. And uh, these corneas are quite clear, and this is a case uh, for which DSEC triple was done. The visual acuity is 6 by 12. There are no sutures at all, and there's hardly any astigmatism. Of course, uh, sometimes the desmet's membrane tags may be there, uh, which need to be seen. And when you have hazy corneas like that, it is best to uh, use a crescent blade over which these bluish tags, which are stained with the trypan blue dye, can be seen. Uh, leave no tags behind because otherwise they'll interfere with the apposition of the graft. And this is something that we publish, crescent as a reflector in haze for desmet's membrane tags. We do have intraop OCT microscope, not that you require it, but it just helps you to fine tune your surgery. And you all have been there, you all have seen in the uh, operation theater in RP center that uh, these microscopes are there. And when you actually pull the graft inside, you can see where the graft is and you can see the orientation of the graft as well as the morphology of the graft, which in hazy corners probably you would just have to imagine and 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 not, not uh, be uh, able to see that, see that clearly. And when you inject air, the graft gets stuck to the back of the cornea. And notice, and notice that, that there are some, there's some, there's some space there, which probably you wouldn't uh, uh, appreciate if you just uh, saw through the operating microscope and not through the IOCT. So like I said earlier, it just helps you to fine tune your surgery better and get to your uh, titrating point better. This is a very elegant paper which was published by Dr. Titi Alsen on uh, this with the help of IOCP.
I just want to show, show that, that DSEC can, can be done for a variety of indications which include CHED. This is a case uh, of uh, CHED for which DSEC was being done. Desmetorexis is done. And in this case, we are doing using under air because CHED corneas are really thick. You can see nothing if you, even if you, you know, stay in it, especially when you're doing desmetorexis. And then uh, the uh, desmets, uh, this is a desmets membrane stripper when you have uh, uh, desmets membrane which is quite stuck to the back of the cornea, then you may have to use a dedicated stripper for this. And then notice that this is the desmets membrane which has come out. And what you need to do is the graft loading it onto the Bucin's glide. And then the whole system, the whole system is uh, reversed. reversed. And now the Bucin's glide is dropped into the your wound. Uh, wound. And you create, and you create a, sort a sort of a tunnel so that the graft is trifolded. It's not bifolded, it is trifolded. And you see nothing absolutely. But the, but the moment you inject air in, air in these cases, because of the, because of the internal the reflection that is present, you can the see the graft and then you can center it. So although, so it, although doesn't it doesn't appear to appear clear, to clear you, know, you know, in on the, on the table, table itself, itself, as you would realize that all the other grafts are, but it does clear over a period of time, and this is one such case. Of course, we've done this even with the uh, intraop OCT microscope, where desmetorexis has been done, and you can actually see the desmet membrane remnants, or uh, uh, which may be present here. Uh, and in case you miss them on the operating microscope, you can pick them up here. You can see these small remnants there. Again, I'm showing you the crescent, use of the crescent blade. Notice how well you can see these desmets membrane tags, which you can't see otherwise. Uh, and after you've removed these desmets membrane tags, again, on the Bucin's glide, this is loaded. The graft is pulled. And, and the air is injected. injected. Just, and just as you inject the graph, you can see stuck to the back, the back of the cornea. Now, now uh, again, this again is going to be published in clinical ophthalmology. Uh, this is uh, the case uh, that I showed you, and it does look clear over a period of time, it will only get better. And if you had to do a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty, you can imagine that, you know, this child has to live for so long, there would be 100 other problems related to sutures. But now that doesn't occur. Now, uh, uh, these are just to show some of our DSEC triple cases uh, with the DSEC and the cataract surgery that were done. Then you come to ultra thin DSEC because the thinner is better and it gives you a better quality of vision. Now, notice you can't even make out that there's a graft there. The graft is less than 100 microns. And uh, we did do a randomized study where we compared microkeratome assisted ultra thin DSEC. Uh, comparing single pass versus double pass technique uh, and when you do a single pass then you use a 400 microns uh, keratome to get 100 microns or sub 100 micron thing and in double pass you would you would probably use two keratomes at 250 micron and 100 micron now, this is just to show how do you get an ultra thin uh, cut on on the uh, micro keratome so uh, this is uh, cornea which is full thickness the tissue is cut using 400 microns uh, uh, micro keratome and when you do that uh, uh, the underneath that you have is almost uh, as thin as this about 70 microns of residual thickness so it's a sub 100 micron graft and this is ultra thin uh, dsec now, there can be problems sometimes with the ultra thin dsec it's so thin that it kind of inverts in your uh, Operating, operating microscope. So what you can do is that you can look at the intraop OCT microscope, get it into the correct configuration. So it should be like this along the curvature of the cornea. And then you would know that this is endothelial side down. So this is, of course, meant more for cornea specialists and less for postgraduates. But I just thought this will tell you the problem of an ultra thin DSEC graft, especially when you are operating. And, and of course, course uh, this is yet another case of ultra thin DSEC. Then you can do DSEC with ACIOLs in place. There's no problem with, with iris claw lenses if they're not touching the back of the cornea. Uh, you can uh, do even a glued IOL with DSEC, and Dr. Rajesh Sinha has uh, published a whole series of it. You can do DSEC in AFAK vitrectomized eyes, and again, we've uh, published this also. What I mean to say is that DSEC can be done in all sort of complicated uh, cases, unlike your DMEC, uh, where you cannot do it in all cases. Now, this was just to show that sometimes, you know, you do a DSEC, which is D-shaped. So it's a repaired corneal perforation. Uh, of course, the cornea is hazy because of endothelial decompensation. So we are uh, uh, cutting the uh, circular uh, button in such a manner that you have a D-shaped edge to it. 
and then and you load, load it uh, the in the correct orientation in the Dusen slide, and again pull it uh, intracamerally inside. And, and then you get the straight uh, axis of the graft uh, uh, aligned, well aligned with the axis of the, uh, uh, the straight edge here. And then notice that this is the post-op picture. The graft looks uh, pretty much uh, clear as opposed to the pre-op picture. So this can also be customized. Now in case of keratoglobus, this is a case of keratoglobus which has got endothelial decompensation after a cataract surgery which has been done. If you do a large graft in this case, which is a PK, it's, it's surely going to fail. So what again we did in this case was a DSEC and uh, only thing is you have to take a 9.5 millimeter graft in this case because it's a large cornea and again it is pulled inside and then air bubble is instilled and it's a voluminous AC. It tends, the graft tends to move here and there but then that's fine and this is the post-op uh, picture with good results again and again it will not have problems of uh, graft rejection or failure. Now even in cases of buphthalmos, this was a case of one-eyed uh, girl who had uh, buphthalmos. We had done a desect but the graft failed so we are doing a repeat uh, a, a repeat desect in this case. So even when you have to repeat it, it the graft comes out very easily. You just have to, uh, uh, with the help of the reverse Sinsky, make a nick there all over. And uh, again, this is another graft which has been taken with a healthy uh, donor tissue and then subsequently pulled intracamerally inside. Again, notice like a keratoglobus, it's a voluminous AC and this is pulled inside and again, uh, air bubble is instilled. So as soon as you pull the graft inside, the first thing I would run and do is put an air bubble there because as soon as I see the edges of the graft there uh, because of internal reflection i know where it is and then moving it in a tight in air chamber over the uh, uh, over uh, with the help of the air over it with the help of cannula is is quite simple now, this was the one eyed patient this is of course the artificial eye and this is the patient with buphthalmos patient for which we had done a desec graft and the patient is doing well so, so if you look at the results of the DSEC, the best corrected visual acuity is better than 612. In almost 70 to 90 percent cases, there's hardly any astigmatism. And because it's less amount of tissue, there's less graft rejection. So 7 percent uh, for uh, DSEC versus 28 percent for PK versus 1 percent for DMAX. So I think that is something that you should remember. Endothelial cell loss is almost the same, which is to the tune of 25 to 28 percent. But there can be other problems because you're adding tissue it to it. So there can be hyperopia of 1 to 1.5 diopters. And of course, there can be dislocation such as left viscoelastic or if there's some tags there, uh, then this can be there. And some, when you do have a little bit of detachment, you can rebubble it without any problem and it clears over a period of time. I come, I come to the, the next frontier, 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 new frontier, in fact, in endothelial keratoplasty, and that is DMAC, which is the most physiological graft because you are replacing a diseased desmets membrane with a healthy desmets membrane. Again, this can be surgeon cut or it can be pre stripped, pre strained in the eye bank. The endothelial cell count has to be high, but but the important thing is that age has to be more than 40 years because if you have less than 40 years, then the scrolls are very tight and they don't open up. Also, you, you need a non-diabetic donor for this because diabetic donor scrolls are again very tight. Now, just to show you what a DMEC surgery is, in this you don't need a microkeratome, so that's one cost which is saved. Uh, this is a, a corneoscleral rim, so uh, you're detaching the Desmets membrane uh, from the scleral spur all around 360 degrees. Stain it with the tripan blue dye and with the help of the McPherson forceps, you're pulling the edges of the Desmets membrane right up to the center here. So you do that just to do like in cases of FACO in four quadrants. So in all the four quadrants, you get the Desmets membrane right up to the center and then lay it back. So once you lay it back, you'll have to dry it. And then this is eight and a half for trifine, which is being used to trifine the central part and the uh, uh, tripan blue staining is then being done uh, following which the because you've removed everything before the peripheral is just removed like this which comes out very easily and the central part is then uh, removed with the help of the macpherson again this has been detached before so there are no issues to it at all because it is just waiting to be uh, stripped there uh, because it has already been uh, pre-stripped before 
so this is the dis uh, role now uh, for uh, injection into the anterior chamber this is a case of fixed dystrophy wherein again we have done the uh, cataract surgery and now the diseased desmets membrane is being uh, uh, is being removed uh, with the help of the reverse sinski again after uh, detaching it and i want you to look at this red picture biceps curl upward so this is the correct orientation of the graph and after you remove uh, the remnants of the desmets membrane this is the diseased desmets membrane which is removed uh, this can be done in iol cartridge uh, injector also but we do have uh, quite a uh, cannulas with us and this was the very first case of in fact dmac that i had done and i would like to acknowledge dr nagesh who was the senior resident with me at that time who helped to do this and as soon as you put in the graft you put suture because it's very likely that the graft will just come out and again, again look at this configuration it is upside down so the moment you see this this is upside down so put some fluid there so that it flips and now this is the correct side up which is your biceps curl upwards so you know that it is endothelial side down and then you put the air bubble and at, as you put the air bubble the graft gets stuck to the cornea and you can't even make out where the graft is so this is the uh, post op week 1 and this is the post op month 1 so even if you are Fellow of the Maldives, he sees. He'll say, "There's no graft there," unless he sees extremely carefully, because it looks very much like the eye in which phaco has been done. Now, uh, you may not have an intraoposit microscope, so for all those places, what we do is use S-shaped stamp, so the peripheral part of the cornea is removed, uh, just like I showed you before. Uh, uh, you pull the desmets membrane right up till here. Uh, after, after uh, coming out i mean almost to the tune of 3/4 and 1/4 uh, uh, here and then after doing this you define it which is done 3 mm to fine is being used in the center and then lay it back over there so after you lay it back the corneoscleral rim is then uh, flipped on the other side this is laid back one has to be very careful because the desmets membrane is so fragile the moment you allow it to uh, you know you allow too much of fluid it starts to misbehave because it gets sucked in by the capillary action so you dry it completely flip this and because you stiffened it earlier you have this lid beautiful it looks like a desmets seal there so you have this lid which you open dry it again because we don't want smudging of the s there take a s marker which is there stain it with the trypan blue dye and very gently put an s mark there so put an s mark there and then now once you do that then you are now s means stroma s doesn't mean sharma s means stroma so it is the stromal side which is up and uh, then uh, subsequently uh, you can take the graft it's again stripped already so you just uh, need to uh, you know remove it from there and put it into the uh, petri dish so now just look at the roll so beautifully this is a tri fold kind of a graft which is there and of course we did publish mioct guided uh, dmac in corneas with poor visualization I, i want to show you this case in which even s could not be seen so uh, hazy cornea scar desmets membrane so desmetorex is done again in this case and uh, this is uh, your graph which is being put the s is there but you can't see the s because it's so hazy and this scroll is very tight see it's it's like, it's, it's like a spiral there sitting there, sitting there. So, so again you have to flip it and you have this intra intraop oct microscope it is folded now so it's so not it's going to come out so uh, you again tap tap now it has got into that bicep curl configuration so you know, so you know your endothelial side down and tap 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 again till uh, you know you get it completely straight and then put air bubble so uh, this is the post op picture so over a period of time it does clear up and, and uh, this, is this is just to show of the results of the same now sometimes, now sometimes you can have these peripheral detachments but when you rebubble then it becomes clear and the corneal edema also comes down then sometimes there can be the folds which may be there so uh, you do uh, uh, this metorex is again in this case like i showed you now i think the steps must be learned by heart by you i don't think 
that will be any problem in describing. This is the Goida Canada and this is the graph which is being taken inside. It's so blue you can see in the Goida Canada itself and then you inject it inside. Once you inject it, you tap, tap, tap again, just like I told you before. Then have a look at the intra OCT microscope also and tap, tap. And notice there's a fold here. Now, if you put the air bubble now here, the fold will remain there only. It's not coming out. And if you put the air bubble, the fold still remains there. It's still there. You can't leave it like that. So best is to uh, put some fluid above the fold. And when you put the fluid above the fold, it kind of unfolds. And then you are there. And the correct S is looking at you. So you know that your graft is oriented in the correct direction. Of course, uh, uh, when you have, have when we transitioned, transitioned from uh, DSEC to DMEC, we realized that there were cases of failed DSEC and we could do a DMEC in them. So the visual quality would be much better. This is a failed DSEC. You notice that we are removing the graft. It's so thick. Here also it can be seen. It can be seen here also. So it's very much doable. And this is your uh, graft, which is there. S. So load it like this. Load it in the configuration that it is supposed to go. So load it like this. Put, put it intracamerally inside. Get it to the correct configuration. Get biceps curl upwards. Get S in front. And then, and then inject the bubble. air bubble. So, so the, the S is staring, staring at you, which means you are in the correct direction. And as soon as, as, soon as you inject the air bubble, the, the graft gets, gets stuck to the back of the cornea. Of course, uh, of course uh, uh, I will show you just the post op results now. This is DMEC in ICE syndrome. Again, it helps. Then, uh, then uh, this I have already told you. These are all the DMEC cases. This is just to show that we also did a fake DMEC, where the uh, lens is uh, pretty much clear. So sometimes, so sometimes you can have situations like this, uh, for instance, in herpetic endothelitis, young patients. So DMEC has been done. And the outcomes are good. Endothelial cell loss is 26% uh, in first month, a little more than, you know, DSEC. The post-op graft detachment is also in DMEC more than DSEC. Primary graft failure rates are more because you can understand that surgically it is more challenging. But there's no, but there's no hyperopic shift. shift. It does have, it a, does have a steep learning curve, curve but it gives very good quality of vision. Now, and I, now I come to the last uh, technique, technique of endothelial, endothelial keratoplasty, and that is PDEC. And again, I want you to have a look at this uh, at this layer, which is your uh, pre desmets layer. So in PDEC, actually, you are not going to take desmets membrane alone, but also this layer, which is the Dua's layer. And so as a result of which, this graft is a little more splinted. So it is somewhere between ultra thin DSEC and DMEC. It can be against surgeon cut, cut or could be pre-stripped. The endothelial cell count has to be good. But the advantage is that you can use grafts of any age. So how you prepare the graft is like this. So you inject air bubble this in, in, in the corneoscleral rim. As you inject the air bubble, the, uh, the, the, the bubble is there. Uh, look at the bubble, which is, you know, sitting on the top there like this. Uh, put uh, uh, tripe and blue dye. After putting tripe and blue, blue dye, you have to excise the edges of the graft, which is done with the Vana scissors. And of course, I do feel that a little more endothelial cell loss would be there uh, as compared to a DNA graft. And then, and then subsequently, this is a case in which it was done. So again, always remove the epithelium because underneath, you know, it, it's going to be clear. And then again, do a desmetorexis like I showed you earlier. This is the diseased desmets membrane which is being removed. And then take this graft and inject it inside. Now here, it's not going to behave like a DMA. Is, is has to be, has to be physically with the help of two instruments unfolded, unfolded over an air bubble. bubble. It, doesn't so it doesn't tap tap tap, tap, tap like like a like DMA graft tap tap tap. tap, tap. So this doesn't tap tap tap, 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 tap because it's kind of, it's kind of splintered with the doer's layer. But the advantage, but the advantage is that you can use any age donor, donor cornea in this. It behaves a little differently. And this is the post up picture of this. And Dr. Chandra Devi has done a thesis on this where she's uh, compared PDEC with DMEC and shown that chances of uh, the rates of rebubbling are far less with PDEC as compared to DMEC. 
it's so it's more robust, robust easier to handle, handle rolls, rolls easier less handle, easier to unroll uh, easy, uh, easy manipulation, manipulation great centration donor tissue from any age can be used endothelial cell losses similar, similar possibly when experienced people do it but the limitation but the is that you are, you are limited by the size, size of the big bubble. So, so if your big bubble, bubble your, endothelium your endothelium would be less. Would be less. So, that's so that's one flip side, side of this. Now very, now very briefly I'll tell you these graphs can fail. Can fail. Everything is not rosy and, and you know happy okay. about it. So there can, so there be, can problems be problems and this is very much from the uh, lecture that I took on the American Academy of Ophthalmology Subspeciality Day. Why grafts fail? So it could be because of surgeon related factor, patient related factor or tissue related factor and you can have primary graft failure or secondary graft failure. So, so if you don't have a great, have a great tissue, uh, then, it uh, then it could be a problem. Be a problem. Or if the anterior segment is not great, then, then there can be problem. Be problem. And, and of course, if the surgeon is in his learning curve, curve, then there can be problem. So this, so this I have already shown you. There's a, there's a detachment, detachment like this. You can always rebubble it. There's, there's a detachment like this again. This has to be addressed. So these can be there. These problems can be there. Then you can have secondary glaucoma. You can even have infection. We've had a couple of infections in our DC grafts. Rejection, Rejection is important, is important uh, like, like I said, I but for postgraduates, if you remember, 1% percent versus 7% percent versus 28% percent, uh, for, uh, you know, PMAC, DSEC and PKP respectively, for you it is good enough. Only, Only remember that DSEC signs are very subtle, it is asymptomatic, there is hardly uh, a slight decrease in visual acuity and mild photophobia. And, and uh, it, looks like it looks like this. It doesn't look like a PK rejection, which is very angry looking and very florid. It is very subtle. Mild KPs, small KPs are going to be there. Thickness will be slightly increased. So you can miss it. So we have to see it in every follow up case. Treatment remains the same topical intensive steroids, gradual taper, and maintenance dose, daily dose thereafter. I would put all my DSEC and BMEC grafts on one drop a day uh, steroid, which could be FML in the long term. I would never stop steroids for the simple reason reject at any point in time. Of course, this I've already shown that if there is a problem, you can redo these cases. And uh, uh, there can be problems even with BMEC, which could be primary graft failure or secondary graft failure. And there can be rejections with it. Again, this is even more subtle than you would have a DSEC rejection. So much so that there will be only slight decrease in visual acuity or glare acuity. Even your best corrected visual acuity may not change. Very difficult for the patient to even, you know, uh, ascertain that a graft rejection episode is occurring. And uh, four weeks topical steroids, few KPs could be seen and there were more KPs when this graft got rejected and this is just to show a DMEC rejection which was managed on topical steroids at four weeks. Again, your uh, your uh, therapy remains pretty much the same. And of course, for a DMEC which is failed, you can do a repeat For a repeat, repeat DMEC like was done for this case, even the repeat, the DMEC graft which had failed initially will come out uh, easily. You can see very faintly that it is coming out. This is a DMEC graft and not not the patient's dismissed membrane. So this comes out quite easily and you can put a physiological, you can put a healthy graft there. So it's like, you know, you can exchange it. It's 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 quite simple on uh, if you see that. And of course, if all else fails, then you have no option such as this, a failed DSEC and due to infection, for which we had to do a full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. So, uh, this is what I wanted you to know because this is something that is asked in your exams. PKP could be 21 or 28 percent. So it's easy to remember seven threes are 21. This is almost the same except that DMEC is a little higher. Otherwise, it is 25 to 28 percent. So one cornea, Dr. Radhika also said, can be uh, you know used for three recipients. Uh, this we published uh, way back in 2007 uh, for DSEC, ALTK, and for limbal stem cell transplantation. One donor, one donor cornea, cornea for three recipients. We use one cornea for two recipients, that is ALTK and the DSEC 
and uh, this uh, uh, this uh, publication was done with Dr. Prakash, uh, who was with me at that time, senior resident, and Dr. Chandra, who was also a senior resident at that time. I'm really grateful to all my residents and students who helped us to you know learn and uh, do this. This was the very first case. Uh, that I showed you, uh, Dal Demek, that we did the first case that we did with Dr. Nagesh uh, Demek, and the anterior top, and then the, the rest of the cornea we used it for uh, that. So to conclude, endothelial keratoplasty does have a learning curve and uh, more so for DMAC than DSEC, but refinements and techniques and modifications will continue to occur, and it is the treatment of choice for all endothelial pathologies. Thank so thank you very, very much for your kind attention and if there are any questions I would be very happy to take them. So, did you understand or did you not understand because there are no questions? What happened, Aniru? Did you understand anything? Yes, ma'am, please understood. Okay. Can we do DSEC? Yes, uh, in CHED cases, sometimes you cannot, uh, you know, make out uh, the distance and it doesn't fit that well. So, you, so have, you can do a non uh, uh, Test, or what do you say is it is called without, without scoring, scoring the test match also you can do a DSEC. So Anirudh, that was the only thing that I missed which you pointed out that you can do DSEC. Okay, next time I will include this also. You can do it, especially in case of CHED where it becomes very difficult for the test match membrane to be, you know, scored because it's quite adherent. So it doesn't matter. You can still do it and get away with it and the corneas will still clear up in the post-op period. So the question is, do we use AC maintainer in all the ca cases? And yes, the answer is we use AC maintainer in all the cases. Up to the point you have docked your bucin light and you're pulling the graft intracamerally. As soon as you're putting pulling the graft intracamerally, you'll put your AC maintainer off because you don't want the graft to be, you know, uh, you, want it, you want it to go inside and not come outside. But as soon as your graft is inside, uh, and it's in correct, correct orientation, we'll just remove, remove the AC maintainer because then its function is over. All you need to do is put air bubble there. Not really, but yes, you can do some modifications. Uh, so the question was in PDEC, is it under our control that you'll get a type 1 bubble or the type 2 bubble? And the answer is that yes, uh, to some, to some extent, extent you can control, but not entirely. But if you, but do, if you do have a type 2 bubble, bubble, you can still convert that PDEC graft into a DMEC graft. That, that, that would become too complex for you. I even have a couple of cases uh, where we did uh, for Dr. Chandra's thesis. But you can still do it and uh, get away with the DMEC procedure. So the question is that what should be the duration of low potency steroids after DMEC or DSEC? So in the initial first three months, we would give high potency steroids. Then we can shift to softer steroids uh, and uh, then taper it. But like I said, I generally would give for all grafts, whether it is PK or it is not for DAL, but for PK or it is uh, endothelial uh, keratoplasty of any uh, kind, I would put them on, on one drop a year, provided that they are not steroid responders uh, for a lifetime. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Attendance, please. Thank you. Thank you. Of course.